here uh, tonight uh, and one of the co-chairs of our new National Advisory Council, actually, uh, Amy Siyoshi, who's an Associate Professor of History. Uh, Associate Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies. There we go. Associate Dean of a College of Ethnic Studies and... Oh, professor in Sexuality Studies and Universities Studies. I should really get my hand into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, she has a long list. She yes. does. She has a long list. She's also the author of the wonderful book uh, out here. And please take a, a look at that. Uh, you have a new book coming out also yes. in March, yes. don't you? Yes, I do. It's What's it called? Discriminating Sex. It's this about the turn of the century, gender and sexual freedom in mm -hmm. San Francisco, and how it is the beginning of a pan Asian American stereotype. Great, so um, I'm sure we'll have an event around that and the book yes. signing as well, yes. yes. Um, uh, so, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Terry, for the introduction. Um, and thanks so much to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amy Soyoshi, and I'm a historian by training. I'm a faculty member in Race and Resistance Studies and Sexuality Studies at San Francisco State University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous custodians of the land, the Muwekma Ohlone. We thank their elders, past and current people, for allowing us to be here today. I also would like to thank co-curators Paul Lichtenberg and Bill Lipsky for meticulously putting together this Faces exhibit uh, on what is often a lesser known clear past before the 1940s. This evening, I'd like to talk about two faces in particular in this exhibit, Faces, which is right over there. Charles Warren Stoddard and Ione Nowicki. The picture of Charles is a little bit younger. I think it's in the framed picture over there. And Ione Nowicki is right next to him on the right side. Does anyone know anything about these two? Okay. How many Ione Nowicki from your book? Okay, and what about Yon and what do you know about him? Um, that he was a really interesting guy. Okay. <laughs> do you remember how he was interesting? Or? Please don't test me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to add anything? So, uh, Charles Gordon Stoddard is one of my ancestors, and I found out about him through my uncle, who unfortunately has passed. But when I came out to him, he was telling me that there's a long line of unmarried men in our family tree. <laughs> and that he was one of them, and that he was contemporaries with Walt Whitman and Ambrose Bierce. Absolutely. And uh, so I started looking into his work and found out about uh, In the Pleasure of His Company, which is the, his only novel, from what I'm aware of. It's a semi autobiographical novel of the turn of the century, and it's considered the first, open, it's first American novel with openly gay themes in it, and it was published in 1903. Good, perfect. And who's an American theater, maybe? Yes. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I know, I, I've been researching the period, so I'm, I've been researching about Ina Colbert and about George Sterling, and he's he threaded it like their lives with the literary scene in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century. Yes. And I believe he was the one who gave Ina Colbert her first big break in terms of publishing here in San Francisco. Uh -huh. You ran a literary magazine, I believe, here? Uh, Star did? Yeah. He's very involved in a number of literary magazines, yeah. Yeah, was it the Overman Monthly? He, he, he wasn't one of the founders, necessarily, of the Overman Monthly, but he did contribute. Uh, not, not a lot, but here and there, for sure. Yeah. And why do you think it's important to talk about Yone Noguchi and Charles Moore Star? What, what, why do you think it's important, folks? Um, can you talk into the mic? Oh, sure. Especially with the air conditioning. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So why do people, uh, folks, think that it would be important to talk about Charles Warren Stoddard and Yone Noguchi? Yes? I'm just I think they're, I, I, like, I don't know much about Yone Noguchi, which I'm really excited to learn more about. But um, for me, it was just personally, like, mind-blowing knowing that they were revolutionary in the sense that they were willing to publish voices uh, with homosexual themes in it at a time when it wasn't being done. There have been other authors in America who had moved to Paris and lived in Berlin and had that freedom and opportunity because they had the money, but for them to do that at that time was really revolutionary. Okay. Any other thoughts on why it might be important? Yes. Yeah. Well, they were 
early international, interracial, interracial, and intergenerational as a couple. Sure. It's important to document those relationships, okay? So by talking about these two faces, I hope to illuminate five ideas which may be obvious to you. One is that queers, and more specifically rice queens, existed in the 1890s, that Bohemians were super gay, that Issei or Japanese immigrants could also be queer, that Japan stood centrally in the formation of what historians document as an all-white Bohemian culture, and finally, that even our most seemingly radical sex acts are likely not so radical. I'm drawing largely from my book titled Queer Compulsions, which details same-sex and interracial love at the turn of the 19th century. If you're mesmerized after this talk and want to learn more, you can buy a copy of the book from the museum gift shop, in which case the entire cost of the book will go directly to the museum. I've brought a few copies as well that I'm happy to pass on to you at the author rate. So who was Charles Warren's daughter? Stoddard was born in Rochester, New York in 1843 to a once prominent family in decline. 17th century Stoddards had attended Harvard to become physicians and ministers. The same year Stoddard was born, his paternal grandfather was a wealthy physician practicing in nearby Pembroke, New York. Stoddard's father, Samuel Burr Stoddard, in comparison was, quote, an uneducated ne'er-do-well. In, the 18, in, in 1850, he declared bankruptcy and relocated his family to San Francisco after failing in the paper manufacturing business. At home, Stoddard's mother raised the children as, quote, God-fearing Presbyterians. Outside of the home, the diversity on San Francisco streets mesmerized the young Stoddard as he explored various neighborhoods. Chinatown, in particular, fascinated him, so much so that he decorated his room with oriental mementos. Yet even as Stoddard appeared engaged with all the city had to offer, he felt notably disengaged from his male peers. He saw himself as timid and, quote, sensitive, disliking games and preferring to lounge about and, quote, build dreams. Other boys would comment on his frailty and his paleness and Stoddard's inability to do well in school only contributed to a sense of alienation. In 1859, 15-year-old Stoddard declined attending San Francisco High School to instead pursue a literary career and become the boy poet of San Francisco. He began as a clerk selling books in a bookstore on Montgomery Street and wrote poetry in his spare time. Later, publication in a new monthly magazine called Golden Era brought him in contact with literary types such as Ina Colbreth, Bret Hart, and Mark Twain. Through the 1860s, Stoddard took on odd jobs and increasingly published more poetry, which often meant unfavorable reviews. In 1864, after a year at Brayton Academy, an attempt to return to school, Stoddard found himself afflicted with a nervous disorder. He traveled to Hawaii to restore his equilibrium. When Stoddard began writing about his Hawaiian travels in 1869, did he begin to win recognition as an accomplished Western writer? For Stoddard, the Pacific Islands reflected not merely material for his writing career, but more profoundly a refuge from the, quote, sexual hypocrisy of civilization and frigid manners of Christians. Pacific Islanders, unafraid of, quote, instincts, would serve as his haven for same-sex affection. In a letter to Walt Whitman, Stoddard wrote of his motivations to return to the South Seas. Quote, barbarism has given me the fullest joy of my life, and I long to return to it and be satisfied. For Stoddard, the Pacific Islands served as a sexual utopia that not even, quote, California, where men are tolerably bold, could provide. Stoddard was hardly alone in his imperial same-sex predilections. In the late 1800s, 
Many European, quote, explorers, such as Cecil Rhodes, E.M. Forster, and Andre Yeed, who sought same-sex fulfillment, found refuge in colonial outposts in Africa and Southeast Asia, as well as the Pacific and Caribbean islands. In a small town called Tsushima, 10 miles west of Nagoya City in Japan, Okua Noguchi gave birth to her fourth son, Yonejiro, on December 18, 1875. Okua's husband, Dembe, worked as a merchant selling paper, umbrellas, and geta, or wooden slippers. While the couple appeared typical of commoners, or heiming, they may in fact have proved a bit different from other small merchant families who just seven years previously occupied the lower rungs of Japan's four-tiered social structure. Okua's brother was the famous Buddhist scholar, Shaku Taishun, and Denbei's father at one point owned a small plot of land. Yet, for Okua and Denbei, life for the most part appeared relatively modest without national prestige nor noteworthy wealth. The birth of Yonejiro likely proved eventful in their otherwise quiet rural life. Meanwhile, halfway around the world, in Paris, 32-year-old Charles Warren Stoddard spent his days cavorting with young male art students in the Latin Quarter. On evenings when he felt bold, he frequented dance halls to see cross-dressing performers, though he had recently received a threatening letter from his former lover, Frank Millen, condemning his flitting about like a butterfly, the socially active Charles appeared unaffected. Stoddard had established himself in both his professional and personal life. He recently published his book, South Sea Idols, and he had long figured out how to find other sexual fulfillment with men such as himself. By using coded language, such as declaring his unfaltering admiration for Walt Whitman, he found literary men also inclined towards intimacy with other men. In Paris, he freely found same-sex affection, despite warnings from one close friend to, quote, avoid any appearance of eccentricity while in Europe. He had not lived his earlier years with as much self-confidence or ease. For young Yonejiro, life in Nagoya in the 1880s proved more mundane. In 1885, excitement came to the 10-year-old Yone in the form of his first Wilson spelling book. He slept with it every night, hoping to repeat that day's lesson if he awoke in the middle of the night. The smell of the foreign book charmed, mystified, and possessed the young boy. Yone immediately fell into what he believed at the time would be a lifelong romance with the English language. So intense would his fever to learn English become that in the evenings, he would stand against the fence of one missionary's house to hear the foreign tongue uttered by a native speaker. On another occasion, he followed a woman and her child in hopes of, quote, testing his comprehension until the girl turned around and shouted, Mama, what does this fellow want? At 13, Noguchi began attending the recently opened Otani School, sponsored by Otani Buddhists in Nagoya, and soon after matriculated into the Nagoya Prefecture High School. Yet small town, small town Nagoya soon felt constraining upon Yone, who hoped for more. He then travels to Tokyo to further his education, and in 1893 decides to move to San Francisco in hopes of becoming an English language poet. By 1900, he's published several books of poetry in English, and literary critics considered him a rising star. He later returns to Japan and becomes even more famous, eventually becoming the department chair of English literature at Keio University. After the 1950s, however, Yone became better known as the father of acclaimed artist, Isamu Noguchi. Who knows Isamu Noguchi? Okay, do, do you want to tell me? I mean, I know a sculptor and a designer. Absolutely. So you probably, many of you probably know Isamu Noguchi. He's a famous modernist sculptor, um, and perhaps some of you have a Noguchi table in your living room. Yeah, you have one? No, but I've seen him. OK, OK. Or you have a paper lamp for whom the original designer was Isamu Noguchi. 
So you can get one of these Isamuguchi lamps for anywhere from four to eight hundred dollars, or you can buy a knockoff at uh, Cost Plus for like twenty dollars. Okay. So when Yonet lands in San Francisco in 1893, he can only find low-paying, mind-numbing work. He's too exhausted from his day-to-day -day work to cultivate his poetic ambitions. He moves to Palo Alto in hopes of gaining more knowledge by being close to Stanford, but then ends up washing dishes at the Menlo Park Hotel instead. He's washing dishes so much that his hands are turning blue, black, and swollen, and he's feeling extremely depressed when this other Japanese fella who's sneaking back into the kitchen for an extra piece of cake says, there's this hermit who lives in the Oakland Hills who curses at San Francisco from across the bay. This hermit's name is Joaquin Miller, and he loves Japanese boys. <laughs> so much so that he invites them to come live with him for free room and board. Has anyone heard of Joaquin Miller? Okay, good. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about Joaquin Miller? Anything you've heard about him? No, okay, right. Um, so perhaps some of you have been to Joaquin Miller Park in Oakland. Yes, okay. That's the same guy, a Western writer, buddies with Charles Warren Stoddard, and another prominent Bohemian Club member. So Yonan packs up his stuff and treks out to Oakland meets Joaquin Miller and immediately moves into his home in 1895. From Miller's home, affectionately called The Heights, Yone in his 20s, introduces himself to Charles Warren Stoddard in his 50s via letter, and the two develop a passionate correspondence. Charles lavishes love on Yone with each letter. These affections from Charles are in stark contrast to the daily abuses Yone faces from the rest of anti-Asian San Francisco, where groups of roving young white men regularly spat through stones and chased Japanese as well as Chinese San Franciscans down the block. Charlie's letters are so exhilarating that Yone showers them with kisses upon their arrival. Charlie, Charlie quickly becomes Yone's, quote, dad, and Yone becomes Charlie's kid. According to literary historian Roger Austin, Charles, in fact, had sex with his kids. By this time, Charles Warren Stoddard is pretty famous for all of his books on the Pacific Islands. Stoddard has been called San Francisco's first gay author with the publication of For the Pleasure of His Company, even though it isn't true, and also the founder of the elite fraternal society, The Bohemian Club, which is true. Many of you have probably already seen one of the Bohemian Club buildings when you visited the St. Francis Hotel and their very impressive gingerbread house during the holiday season. The building is located at the top of California Street, across from the St. Francis Hotel on Mason Street. It's still a super elite fraternal society. It doesn't allow women to join, and many presidents as well as other powerful politicians have been members of the club. I think something like every Republican president since 1923 has been a member of the Bohemian Club. In fact, former President Richard Nixon, right there, okay, a Bohemian Club member since 1953, declined an invitation to speak at the club in 1971, noting privately that, quote, Bohemian Grove, which I attended from time to time, is the most faggy goddamn thing you could ever imagine with that San Francisco crowd. I can't shake hands with anybody from San Francisco. This is Nixon speaking. Um, and you, you, probably, you can see Reagan as well, right here, right here. Okay. So Charles Warren Stoddard was one of its early founders. This is of the Bohemian Club in the late 19th century, and he was also a certified rice queen. Yet, on the eve of Charles's introduction to Yone, their potential affection for one another took on greater significance beyond simply an attraction between two people. Japan and America had just sparked a romance of their own as the two nations struggled to satisfy their deepest desires through each other. A modernizing Japan that had long feared foreign imperialism sought to make ties with the West in its realization 
that it could no longer maintain its isolationism. Many Japanese, in hopes of adopting the progress of the West, embraced American technology, styles, and values. Uh, and you can see in this painting that uh, Chikanobu did that all these folks are, are dressed in Western garb. These are supposed to, these are all Japanese folks. See, like that dress is Western as well as these like soldier uni uniforms. Um, for Americans, Japan offered a cure to a cultural malaise brought on by industrialization. Despite progress or economic growth, Victorian intellectuals felt that the quality of life had somehow declined. The US then turned to Japan to gain a more spiritual and pure civilization. Art historian William Hosley noted, like lovers, Japan and the West were eventually drawn to one another by yearning for wholeness and fulfillment. Bohemians, too, were obsessed with things Japanese. By 1891, several members of the Bohemian Club had traveled to Japan and published on Japanese culture and aestheticism. Japanese decor, such as rice paper lanterns, enlivened Bohemian life. At the end of the year's Christmas drinks, the theme song of the Orientalist musical The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan opened the event. Moreover, in 1892, at the Midsummer Jinx, club members rallied to the theme of Buddha. North of San Francisco Bay in Mill Valley, sculptor Marion Wells and his assistants erected an enormous statue of the Buddha, modeled after the famous Daibutsu in Kamakura, Japan. Surrounded by redwood trees, the plaster Buddha stood 70 feet tall at the foot of Mount Tamalpais in a grove called Sequoia Canyon now known as Mirror Woods. More than 200 Bohemians enrobed in white and red kimonos wound their way to the sacred spot to worship the surrounding trees and find higher spiritual consciousness. For San Francisco Bohemians, Japanese culture this served as a familiar and useful tool to further their intellectual and artistic development. As they appropriated what they believed to be authentic Japanese culture to enhance their spiritual lives these, quote, cultured white men would embrace Japan and its people as a conveyor of leisure and exotic titillation. For Charles, his desire for Yone for sure was motivated by his image of him as a sensual oriental, filled with primitive elo eloquence. Yone's eyes appeared to Charles as, quote, windows in the temple full of mystery, his body made of ivory, Charles once complained to Yone, who refused to wear kimono, quote, you are far too Americanized. As Yone's affection for Stoddard grew, Yone seemed aware and approving of the older Western writers' romantic predilections towards other men. Yone expressed sympathy for South Sea idols, Stoddard's book, which detailed his travels through the Pacific Islands, and more provocatively revealed his unabashed delight in, quote, seeing, touching, and being touched by handsome naked males. Stoddard writing of petting and hugging, growing excited as he slept with young Pacific Islander men, all made obvious his own sexual preference for men. In late May, 1897, Yone prayed that he would be friends with this, quote, tender-hearted poet forever. He declared, let us love each other as heavenly twain. Yone soon began, began addressing Star by his first name, Charles, as their relationship deepened. He appealed to Charles by painting himself in diminutive terms, in direct contrast to the older Western writer. Quote, my dearest friend, you are such a lovely man as I am such a lovely boy. Yone closed his letters with hopes to grow closer. Pray, let us be a friend truthful. Let us be able to understand each other. I'd like very much to see you. I long so much to sit by you, when I may have such a fate to go to your Washington home. On days when loneliness weighed heavily on Yone, thoughts of Charles saved him. From, quote, the airy nothing, Yone would conjure Charles's figure to keep him company. Yone declared himself, quote, an oriental youth who came to drink love from the well of Charles's heart. Charles's affection was a gift from God as refreshing and life-giving as shade on a hot summer day. Goodbye, my love, Yone often closed his letters. While Yone enjoyed the attention from Charles, 
He also chafed under what he saw as superficial interest in Japan. As critics pointed to Japan or the Orient in the young poet, Yone himself disliked the racialization uh, in the early years of his American career. In 1896, as Yone answered requests for his pictures, he made it a point not to be photographed in his, quote, native dress. Joaquin Miller explained to the San Francisco Chronicle, quote, Yone Noguchi objects to that sort of interest, saying that he wants to write for America and depends solely on the value of his work. As Yone wrote diligently, he hoped his work would receive merit as exceptional poetry rather than poetry exceptional for its Japanese origin. Yone also protested popular musical comedies of the time during the height of Japanese movement two musical productions, The Mikado and The Geisha, and one novel titled Madame Butterfly, particularly enraged Yone and their yellow-faced actors in mockery of Japan. Yone noted, the vogue of The Mikado or The Geisha, a comic opera, made my true Japanese heart pained as I thought it was blasphemy against Japan. How often I wished to shout from the pit or gallery in its absurdity. He suggested how ridiculously Mitz what's her name acted in the geisha and commented on her absurd appearance akin to a smiling puppet. Indeed, some white Americans blurted out the nonsensical theme song of the musical to Yone in a goodwill effort to connect with his Japaneseness. Yet even more scathingly, Yone criticized Madame Butterfly, warning people against the mistake of buying the popular book. He called the author of the book sarcastically, the author's name is John Luther Long, he called him Mr. Wrong <laughs> to highlight his inaccurate depiction of Japan, a work, quote, full of lies and craziness. Long would be better off sweeping streets than writing such a, quote, completely sad affair. The female protagonist, a, quote, Nippon character, hardly proved Japanese, Yone imagined throwing the book from a transcontinental train ride for the Nevada mountain lions to cherish. Nearly all the major creative works on Japan at the time infuriated Yone. He rejected American interest in things Japanese as, if, as, as cheap, if not utterly insincere. He equated American Japanophilia as merely a curiosity for a dime museum spectacle rather than any real appreciation of culture. As much as Yone noted Charlie's as well as other Bohemians Japanophilia in 1901, he moved into Charlie's uh, Washington DC home called the Bungalow with some expectation of living with Charlie as one of his kids. Charlie welcomed Yone's company as a respite from the loneliness that hung over him as if an unshakable cloud. Two months earlier, Charlie had come to full realization that his current living kid Kenneth O'Connor had outgrown him, was running with a set that had no connection with the older writer and adopted kids of his own. Charlie felt unsettled in both mind and body and yearned for rest and nurturance. He needed, quote, a great deal of cuddling, of which he got of none as of late. Charlie declared, the melancholy days have come, the sadness of these years, I feel greatly depressed. Yet, on the very same mid-December day that Yone moved in, Charlie succumbed to, quote, the grip. Cast in a small hospital room with barred windows to prevent delirious patients from throwing themselves outside, Charlie spent a gloomy Christmas week with another patient uh, who would yell and moan all through the night. For sure, Yone grew despondent over Charlie's illness. He declared, oh well, this world isn't the place of laughter, I fancy. Still, Yone made an effort to make the best of it. Quote, let it go, he reminded himself. Yone then visited the infirmed Charlie every day for the following eight days, bringing letters, a copy of the New York Journal, or other little gifts for Charlie. On Christmas Eve, Yone, with Ethel Arms, brought candy in mistletoe to Charlie's bedside. The three finished the candy and hung the bow under the chandelier over Charlie's head. Ethel Arms, a journalist who would later become famous as the first historian of Alabama through the publication of her book, 
the story of coal and iron in Alabama was likely a lesbian. And I'll talk about her a little more, a little more about her later. Um, despite Nunez's care and attention, Charlie focused on how his living companion, Kenneth O'Connor, neglected him. This is Kenneth. He was a, a veteran of the Spanish-American War, and this is him in his uniform. Charlie grew anxious, wondering if Kenneth had spent all the money that he had given him. On Christmas Day, he resisted going to benediction in the chapel in case he might miss Kenneth if he came to visit. As Charlie waited with anticipation from his hospital bed, Yona reported that Yone, uh, Kenneth was in fact sleeping with, quote, a stranger, a man from the streets that he had brought into the bungalow at around 4 a.m. Charlie cried to himself, quote, what a blow to my Merry Christmas. Oh my God, no more kids for me. Save his playthings. It's broken my heart often enough over this most unworthy one. After Charlie returned home to his bungalow from the hospital, Jonas slept with Charlie at night while Kenneth slept downstairs. In the afternoons, Charlie enjoyed Madeira wine while Jonas puffed on cigarettes. The two lounged about a living room ta uh, table littered with holiday gifts and pillows of pine needles as they bantered back and forth. Charlie, from time to time, passed his fingers through Yone's blue-black hair. For New Year's Eve, determined to cheer up Charlie, Yone bought tickets for the two to see Schatz Vaudeville. An indifferent and perhaps ungrateful Charlie reported the event as, quote, not too much fun. For sure, the loss of Kenneth weighed heavier than the enjoyment of Yone in person. Though Charlie lavished affection on Yone in letters, ultimately, Charlie's longing lay with Kenneth. As a witness to Charlie's pain relationship with Kenneth, Yone felt relieved to leave the bungalow shortly after the holidays. He'd grown exhausted from meeting new people and caring for Charlie. With Charlie's approval, Yone moved to New York City and rented a room so he could finish some writing. He decided it was better to be alone and do what he pleased. Sometimes, quote, he disliked companions. In New York, Yone hires Leonie Gilmore to edit his writing line by line, and they end up living together as, quote, man and wife. At some point during Yone's brief residence in New York, he also begins to date at the arms. Who's right here? Uh, the journalist who he met at Charlie's bungalow, and soon after, they become engaged to get married. Ethel finds Yone fascinating and agrees to marry him because she finds him so unlike a man. She agrees to marry him. She agrees to marry him only if it's just for a year, since she preferred to be married to a woman rather than a man. Charles, of course, disapproves of the engagement, warning Yone that Ethel is, quote, a flirt. <laughs> In 1904, Yone returns to Japan and waits for Ethel to join him as his wife. Even as Leone, uh, now in Pasadena, California, has just given birth to their son, who would later become the acclaimed artist Isamu Noguchi. Um, Ethel ends up not joining uh, Yone because she finds out through the rumor mill that uh, not only uh, is Yone engaged to be married, but actually has a baby. Um, and so Ethel then freaks out and then dumps him. <laughs> For sure, Yone might seem like a renegade in his intergenerational same-sex love with the older Charles, his then simultaneous affairs with two other white women, since state law banned marriage between whites and Asians. Oh yes, and it appears he was also kissing at least one other fellow Japanese-American Kosen Takahashi. He was an illustrator of the San Francisco Japanese language newspaper titled Shinsekai. Charles, too, might seem like a rebellious queer forging same-sex affairs, not just intergenerationally with whites, but also across race. As transgressive as their affairs might have appeared in heteronormative and racist San Francisco, both Noguchi and Stoddard's affairs occurred within the confines of acceptability 
and reflected the way in which seemingly self-determined private actions continued to be bound by racial wars. It was relatively acceptable in the late Victorian period to have romantic same-sex relationships. Some of these uh, images are reflected in the Faces exhibit. Even as explicit homosexual homosexuality remained absolutely not okay. By the time Yona arrived at the port of San Francisco, the city's bohemians had enjoyed over two decades of fraternity. Writers and artists formed networks in which men openly expressed warmth and tenderness for one another without the stigma of homosexuality and enthusiastically experienced cultures not their own. They gathered in each other's rented rooms in the Latin quarter of the city where the odor of sour wine and a cacophony, cacophony of Italian and Spanish floated in and out of the dark streets. The proximity of San Francisco's sexually illicit red light district, the Barbary Coast, added adventure to these social events. <coughs> Bohemians also ventured to subterranean bars where an orchestra or a vocalist enlivened the patrons. After midnight, journalists who had just finished submitting their last copy would join already inebriated painters and musicians. Together, they ate sandwiches, bursting with bologna sausage and cheese, quenched their thirst with large schooners of beer, shared stories, and sang boisterously. In addition to their nocturnal adventures, Bohemians also gathered for late breakfasts and picnics. At Sunday brunch events, Stoddard played the piano while artists doodled on the tablecloth. Copas, pictured here, was a well-known gathering place where Bohemians doodled on the tablecloth. This mural also is um, done by uh, Bohemian artists. Uh, the Black Cats are actually done by Javier Martinez, who I'll also mention later. More formalized club events took place on the last Saturday of each month in the form of jinx, which I talked about earlier, both high and low. At these events, Stoddard, among other Bohemians, openly exalted bachelorhood, the value of an all-male community, and love. Orders at the jinx notably encouraged the avoidance of women and frequently painted marriage as a relationship of doom. Thus, Bohemian culture promoted an intimate culture of brotherly love. With open emotion and communication, men felt free to express care and affection towards one another. William Dean Howells and Edwin Markin both addressed Stoddard as, quote, sweet or sweetest in their correspondence in the late 1890s. Artist Joseph Strong, considered one of the founders of the San Francisco Bohemian Club, frequently sent his, quote, love to close friend Stoddard in letters that detailed his painful separation from his wife. His wife, or rather, his ex-wife, Isabel Osborne Field, was the stepdaughter of Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, and the reason they got a divorce is that Joseph Strong had an affair with a woman in Samoa, who was Samoan, uh, and Isabella got very upset, demanded a divorce, um, and they got divorced, and then Robert Louis Stevenson then adopted their kid, Austin Strong, which is a little sad, I think, for, for Joseph. And then another side story is that Charles would later try to sleep with Austin, um, since he had grown up to be quite a handsome young man. When Joaquin Miller tersely chased away one of his house guests early in the morning while he was writing from his bed, he quickly apologized by gathering a beautiful bouquet of flowers from his garden and declaring, if you can read what the flowers say, you will see that I am sorry for not greeting you more hospitably this morning. I love you and am glad to see you. At the turn of the century, Bohemians had little reservations about declaring affection with other men if their emotions moved them. Yet Charles Warren Stoddard felt as though he had to live a, quote, double life, according to Roger Austin. While Bohemians nationwide recognized homoeroticism and bisexuality as central to Bohemian life, they refused to be characterized as sexual deviants or homosexuals. Many took up with gender-appropriate spouses to project an acceptable heterosexual persona. Men, quote, happily married, could then share their bed with other men without stigma. Nobody observed that Miller, while married to a woman, 
shared his bed with a man of color. For those who knew that Stoddard grew unusually attached to men, the trait remained, quote, an eccentric affectation of bohemianism rather than sexual depravity. In 1876, when Stoddard advised Joseph Strong that, quote, girls were well enough in their way, but not to go to bed with, Strong vigorously disagreed. This is the one that got divorced in, in, you know, a few minutes ago, writing that, quote, in bed was the very place in which he found women charming. Strong noted, I don't know what to take you for except somewhat of an artist. <laughs> Notably, those who embraced affectionate male camaraderie could be staunchly against same-sex sexuality. Poet George Sterling, who referred to Jack London as his darling wolf, was, quote, repelled by Stoddard's attention. Stoddard began writing effusive letters of ardor to Sterling after he met him at the artist colony in Carmel, California. Sterling confided to his mentor, Ambrose Bierce, that Stoddard was, quote, a case of inversion of sex. Stoddard gave Sterling, quote, the gems. If Sterling was not careful, quote, the old devil might wind up compromising him, said Ambrose Bierce. After Stoddard's death in 1909, Bierce reassured Sterling that, quote, my, object to him, my objection to him was the same as yours. He was not content with the way God had sexed him. Thus, while Noguchi and Stoddard could acceptably share moments of closeness, it remained nonetheless an in intimacy with limits. Explicit homosexuality, so homosexuality remained forbidden. Additionally, when Noguchi confessed to Helen Breidemann his plans for marriage to Ethel Arms in 1904, Breidemann underlined the wiseness of his decision. Quote, I'm so glad you're taking the sane and healthful and normal point of view, after all. Long-continued bachelordom is always a mistake. It marks a man, makes him more or less selfish, even shallow. Breidemann's comment to take the, quote, healthful and normal route and avoid the unwanted, quote, mark, prevailed with e even in these homosocial circles. And while Bohemians welcomed individuals such as Noguchi, to bring interest into their lives, the inclusion of non-whites never meant full membership into the Bohemian Club. In a complete catalog of publications by Bohemian Club members printed in 1937, Noguchi's name and thus his many publications did not appear in the list of 210 writers, nor did his name appear even once in the eight volume official history of the San Francisco Bohemian Club. Despite the stream of young Japanese men who stayed at Miller's home before Noguchi, not one single Japanese name appeared on the comprehensive membership rosters updated in 1895. In fact, no apparent people of color appeared in any photographs or membership lists of the Bohemian Club. Notably, while historians have recorded the extensive club participation of Mexican-American painter, of, quote, Aztec descent, Javier Martinez, he too did not appear in the official documents of the Bohemian Club. Martinez actually ends up uh, one of the women who are sort of peripherally, peripherally involved in the Bohemian Club. And usually, um, when a guy in the Bohemian Club gets married, you get a chest full of silver. Um, but Javier got nothing. And his wife rallied the Bohemian Club, saying it's discrimination, you need to give Javier a chest full of silver, but uh, he never got one. Additionally, when editor Frank Putnam wrote about Noguchi in the Boston transcript, he described Noguchi as part of a cadre of bohemian-like Japs, marking him as simultaneously a part of and separate from more real bohemians. Historian Wilson, Elizabeth Wilson, whose book on Bohemians as Glamorous Outcasts, notes that while turn of the century Bohemian culture made up of mostly white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in both California and New York, 
accepted Jews, Southern and Eastern Europeans, and to a lesser degree, Latinos, they completely excluded African Americans and Asians. Thus, across race lines, Stoddard participated in a culture of Japanese desire where whites more usually pursued objects rather than relationships with Japanese men. To Stoddard, Noguchi would thus appear as a curio to covet rather than a camaraderie uh, in the queer revolution. Even so, Bohemians in early 20th century, as it had been in the 19th century, proved more tolerant than the rest of society. If Bohemians valued ethnic or sexual exploration because of its exotic or adventurous appeal, it was at least better than total exclusion for members of ethnic minorities and men inclined towards same-sex love. Bohemia offered a space, however marginal, in which those excluded from mainstream society could, quote, breathe a different air, according to Elizabeth Wilson. Perhaps most importantly, Stoddard and Noguchi did not see themselves as societal revolutionaries pushing back against unjust norms. Though Stoddard believed his same-sex desire was, quote, natural, he would not be the crusader of gay rights during these more homophobic times. When friends accused Stoddard as, quote, having no blood to risk, he confessed, quote, I am born a colored. Noguchi also deliberately articulated a heterosexual identity for himself, even though his letters revealed that his most significant love lay with Charlie. In the winter of 1905 to 1906, Yone invited both Charlie and Leone, the mother of his child, Isamu, to come live with him in Japan. This is at the point where Ethel Arms had now dumped him. He could, Yone could no longer send money to Leone, and so she suggested she come to Japan. If Leone decided to join Yone in Japan, Yone expected her to work. He wrote explicitly, you must work a few hours every day if you come, because I can only make enough money to keep myself decently. Yone's invitation to Leone diverged significantly from his call to Charlie three months earlier. In October 1905, Yone wished, quote, the sweet old soul Charlie to come for a few weeks at the very least. He wove a tale of paradise to seduce Charlie to his quiet home in Tokyo to retire. A thousand trees and flowers grew in the yard. Two servants would make life comfortable. Quote, I will treat you like a lord, Yone declared. He made enough salary for both himself and another and Yone had chosen Dad to join him. Charlie only needed to worry about the steamship fare, and Yone would take care of everything else. Though he had few regular commitments during the week, he had plenty of time to spend with Charlie if he came to live with him in Japan. Though Yone outlined a veritable utopia for Charlie, he had only cautionary words of encouragement for Leone. This is what he says to Leone. Quote, if you come to Japan and don't mind the work four to five hours a day, we can solve our problem quite easily, I think. We will work our salvation together. Yone assured Leone, we will not starve if our hands are joined and work together, I think. For sure, Yone was likely a Lothario. To be clear, he had in fact both deceived Ethel and Leone into thinking that he was monogamous, while professing love to Charles and sharing kisses with at least one other Ise named Kosen Takahashi. As much as Yone remained an agent in the dramas that unfolded around him, unyielding standards of heterosexuality, monogamy, and family simultaneously fueled his motivation toward deception. For less courageous individuals such as Yone, as well as Charles, openly rebelling against a prevailing norm would remain unimaginable. Noguchi would never declare, I'm queer and I'm here, to negotiate a polyamorous relationship with two women, or even evoke imagery that directly countered popular Japanese as he sought to build better professional and personal networks. Creating pockets of viable existence under seemingly immovable social constraints was a means of negotiating the tangle of race culture, and sexuality that Noguchi and many others faced 
while forging their own fulfillment during times not so conducive for self-actualization for immigrants and queers. In Yona's case, there was no queer liberation, no race revolution, yet his personal affairs powerfully animate America's romance with Japan, just beginning in the 1890s among whites concerned with art and culture. This larger affair called Japanismo and much bigger than Yona's specific intimacies narrates how negotiations of power, privilege, and alienation intimately infused people's private lives. For Bohemians, race would play a critical role in inciting excitement and expressing affection, even as they maintained white supremacy. In revealing long-silenced same-sex realities of Japanese immigrants in America as well, Yone Noguchi's intimate life with Charles Bond Stoddard makes meaning for those of us who are compelled and troubled by the ways in which webs of imperialism, racism, homophobia, and misogyny powerfully shape the most intimate aspects of our lives. Thank you. So I think what happens is when you live in a country where he grew up in a country that where he was the top dog, he was a Japanese man in Japan. So his understanding of the West is not that it's a racist country. It's a country of modernization, right? And particularly as Japan was opening up its trade and its country to now uh, Western influences, J Japan wanted to become a superpower, part of the West. They had just beaten Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, so they felt like they could be, you know, rival any other Western country. Um, a historian named Eiichiro Asma, in fact, writes that Japan sent immigrants to the U.S. in hopes of colonizing the U.S. <laughs> okay, um, so they told the Japanese to become really good Americans, dress Western clothes, learn the English language, uh, eat potatoes instead of rice. Right? These were mandates by the Japanese government to integrate themselves into the U.S. in hopes that eventually the U.S. would take, uh, Japan would take over the U.S. But at that time, there's no concept in the Japanese mind that the West or the Europe is racist because they're growing up in this bubble where they're in their own sort of culture. And they see the West as a site of something to aspire to, something magical. So you discussed that the uh, that there is that within the Bohemian Club there is a great deal of participation from people of color, but that there's also a lot of erasure that follows that. So, like, what, what was that process of erasure? I mean, I, I think that in the formal documentation of both the Bohemian Club history, that's pretty much the erasure that takes place. When you look at all the the personal letters and the documentation among the Bohemians themselves. There's actually a lot of women, as well as sort of uh, men of color, who are involved, um, and and women, women poets, right? I think uh, Ina Kobrith was the first uh, state poet laureate, right? And she was a, a big, a key member, not not a formal member, but a key player in the Bohemian Club. And she could only go into the first floor, but she couldn't go upstairs because um, you know it was prohibited. So there's actually quite a few women, as well as men of color, who are written out of the formal history. Yet if you read the love letters and the, the letters between friends and the writer community, right, um, they're all there. In fact, many of the women were college-educated women, uh, white women, who uh, couldn't get enough uh, commission in the magazines to become self-sustaining writers themselves, but they were editing works. They're editing Ambro Bierce's work. They're editing Yone Noguchi's work. They, you know, all of these bohemian guys and highly educated women writers who are helping them edit their works, yeah, which is also an, another irony. But it is in the formal history that they're completely erased, no doubt about it. Yeah. Yes. In the 
1890 is supposed to be quite unusual for a teenager in Japan to be so motivated to learn English, whatever his particular motivation was at that point. But what drew him at that time when he was interested in English to come to the U.S., to come to California, as opposed to going to England, which was still the dominant English-speaking power in the world in the pre-World War I, 1890s? Yeah, so um, the question is why come to the U.S. instead of uh, go, go to going to England? Um, from my understanding of Asian American history, there's a number of contractors who are recruiting people from Japan, right? And the U.S. had very vibrant companies that were recruiting people from Japan. And they're not necessarily laborers. The very first Japanese immigrants were actually students. They were people who wanted to come to Japan to go to school. And all of those folks had to have an interest in English, um, as opposed to immigrants who might come to the US just for more financial you know, opportunity. So Yone is not that unusual in that he was interested in the US, interested in English. He is unusual in that he wanted to become the foremost English poet, right? Uh, but he's not so unusual in his interest in Japan. From my understanding, in England, there weren't the, the same kinds of recruiting companies that are recruiting folks to immigrate from Japan. Many of the recruiting companies are also Christian. So they're saying, hey, you know, I know it's rough to be Christian in Japan. Why don't you come over to, to the US and life will be much easier. Um, so there's also that, that that's what's, what's going on as well. But these first waves of, of immigrants, I, I do think, are because of these recruiting companies. And I think these recruiting companies also flourish to the US because the distance is kind of shorter, right? You just get on a boat and go versus getting on a boat and then getting on a train, and then, I don't know, getting on a boat again and then on a train. So, but you know, I don't know exactly in terms of that way, but I do know that the companies were very pivotal. Um, another question. Um, did the Bohemian Club have or Bohemian Club members have a lot to do with the political climate of California at the time. So I'm thinking of like gentlemen's agreements and anti-alien laws a little bit later. Yeah, so um, a lot of the Bohemian Club members were uh, definitely high rollers in terms of political government. Um, and in fact, initially the Bohemian Club starts as a very progressive, liberal, not, not progressive in terms of the 21st century, but progressive in terms of the 1900s. Um, they're, they're super interested in Japan. They think Japanese people are getting a raw deal, right? Uh, and the people who actually uh, create much of the anti-Asian climate with the immigration uh, exclusion as well as the alien land laws, they're actually um, people who are uh, like labor, people who are trying to organize laborers. And so Alexander Saxton is another historian who talks about how the Democratic Party basically formed, re-solidified in San Francisco in the 1880s through anti-Chinese sentiment specifically. Uh, but the companies, the people who had more money, wanted these laborers. Doesn't sound so surprising from now, right? Um, and then also the folks who are interested in art and culture, they, they liked Japanese Im immigrants, right? Um, to an extent, but the vast majority of Californians, the vast majority who are workers in California, were super anti-Asian. And these folks in the Bohemian Club were sort of one step above. Um, not to say that they wouldn't support an anti-Asian kind of measure, but Joaquin Miller was definitely opposed to all the anti-Asian legislation that was coming out at this time. Yes? Based on the documents, it's it's. I, I would not say that they were necessarily queer, only because of the explicitly sort of homophobic comments that they would pass to to each other, back and forth to each other regarding Stoddard. But you know, one could say that the homophobic football player is, is actually gay, right? You know, there's that 
sort of line. But in terms of the correspondence, uh, Jack London and George Sterling were not two people that I would consider to be part of this queer cadre. They're definitely involved in the homosocial thing, you know. They're kind of chumming it up, being palsy, being very intimate, using, you know, pretty, pretty um, passionate terms of endearment for each other. But from my understanding, and you probably know way more than I do, but they, 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 there was no indication in their correspondence that they might be in the same way as Charles Warren's daughter. No, they did not. So, um, Roger Austin, who uh, does a biography of Charles Warren's daughter, and there's a number of other literary historians from the 1890s, early 1990s, they, they almost argue that the turn of the century was even less homophobic than when they were, when they were writing their you know, books in the 1990s, for example. These are people who were published in the 1990s. And they say that 100 years ago, there was this unspoken code of acceptability, right? So it's kind of like, don't ask, don't tell, but you could have as much sex as you want and no one would bother you, right? That they had these, you know, it was totally acceptable to have separate spheres, like men weren't supposed to socialize with women anyway, right? So you would have these social clubs that were same-sex exclusive, and so then you would have these romantic friendships that were forged, same-sex romantic friendships, and in queer history, romantic friendships are seen as the precursor of queer history. It's like the very first kind of queer history that they talk about in the US, right? Um, and also in the field, romantic friendships is where a lot of the queer history started. So even as romantic friendships are an acceptable straight way to be homoerotic and homosocial, right? Um, it's considered sort of, I think I just lost track of your question. Um, yeah, yeah. So at that time, there's no arrests, no laws. I did a, I did a survey of sodomy laws from 1870s all the way up until uh, 1930s, and they all clustered. Guess around when? Just take a quick guess. Exactly, because in World War One, all these soldiers are gathering in the Presidio and having sex with each other. Um, and they're also the soldiers are also <coughs> giving up all their money to male sex workers. And so the public health officials are like, you know, these soldiers are getting ripped off, not just by women sex workers, but male sex workers also. And so they start clamping down on sodomy, and then there's the Baker Street fellatio ring that gets discovered, which is also in the case there. And this all happens around World War I. So until World War I, one would say that there was a moment of freedom in the US. But I personally, if I were a gay white guy, I would still rather be living now than in 1890s. Okay. Yes, Drew. Maybe could you briefly sketch for us the later career of Yolanda Gucci? What was his subsequent life after this period? Okay, so um, what happens with Yona is he goes back to Japan. He calls uh, Ethel Dumpson. He calls Leone, the mother of Isamu no Gucci, and Charles to join him. Charles doesn't join him, and he dies about three years later, in 1909, I believe. Um, Leone shows up with her kid, who's now five years old, right? And Charles, I'm not, not Charles, Yona, strangely enough, doesn't come home at all. And Leone is like, what is going on here? And she asks uh, Yona, and Yona says, oh, you know, well, I'm, I'm at the Buddhist temple, you know, I'm, I'm being pious or whatever. Um, so she's like, okay, he's at the Buddhist temple. And I know this because Leone wrote a letter to Charles saying, you know, I, I don't, you know, Yona's never home, but he claims to be at the Buddhist temple. So that's how I know all this detail. What happens later is that, um, this is very sad, but Leone's walk, taking a walk, um, and then she sees a house. And in Japan, you don't have addresses on the house. You have people's last names, right? So she sees a house that has Yone's last name on it. And you know, Noguchi is a pretty common name, but she realizes then that even before uh, she arrived in Japan, he had married a woman in Japan and had, by that time, three or four kids with that woman. 
And he then goes on to become found the English department at Keio University, which is considered uh, the Princeton of Japan. It's a very prestigious university. He becomes the department chair. He also becomes this rabid uh, nationalist, um, saying, and fascist, frankly. Um, and he's all about Japanese imperialism. Uh, and he starts to refute his, uh, his love of America, because the Japanese government now is like, you don't want to love America. You want to love Japan, right, as we conquer Asia, take over Asia. Um, and so he becomes super pro-Japanese. Uh, and then his son, Isamu Noguchi, uh, is now a kid, and he's, he actually is now an adult, sorry. And he's becoming kind of a famous artist. And he wants to tour through China um, and use his father's name, Noguchi, because it's kind of famous. And so he says, hey, dad, can I use your last name, Noguchi? And uh, Yona says, no because you're gonna disgrace the name, you know, because you're an illegitimate kid, blah, blah, blah. But the irony is, is that Isamu then says, screw you, dad, uses the last name anyway, tours through China, and is now clearly the more famous Noguchi. Um, after the war, Tokyo, Japan as a whole, is completely devastated, uh, and Noguchi's uh, eldest born son, writes a letter to Isamu Noguchi, who is now in the US and a super famous artist, and asks him for money uh, so they can rebuild their lives. And Isamu sends uh, money back to Yone and his family. Uh, but then Yone uh, dies, I think, in 1946 or something. And they don't totally reconcile. They reconcile a little bit, but not totally. Um, and they reconcile a little bit because uh, Isamu, the son, agrees to put a sculpture one of his famous sculptures in the garden at Keio University, from which you know Yona has a faculty appointment. So you can go to Keio and see the famous Isamu Noguchi statue there, which is a symbol of father-son conflict. <laughs> Does it have a title? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the title is. You might be able to find it on your phone or something. It doesn't say father son conflict, but you know, if you know the history, it's not a it's not a wonderful, touching tribute to the pops. It's definitely <laughs> laced with conflict. Yeah. And I heard rumors too that Isamu may have been queer, but I don't I don't think it's confirmed or anything. I don't know if any of you folks know, but he had terrible relationships with women, so I think someone thought that he might be. Gay, but you know, straight men also have two relationships with men. So, yeah. so speaking of sculpture, were any of the uh, Stoddard, uh, Noguchi, and the others of that generation connected to Douglas Tilden? Uh, I don't know. I didn't see any evidence. I mean, Douglas Tilden's statues are all in San Francisco when they're you know hanging. Well, actually, Stoddard. I know that many of his statues go up during the Panama Pacific International Exposition. So, you know, they may have seen his. Sculptures walking down Market Street, you know, but it's not clear. They don't. Then his name is never mentioned in any of the materials. But great question, yeah. Do you know if Douglas Tolan was gay? He, I think he, he's considered to be highly likely. Uh, okay. Very nice to get. Yeah. No, definitely the statues are super gay. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, I, I think there's some other evidence, but I forgot what it is. Okay. So. Okay. Um, and there's one, uh, there's this woman named Melissa DeBacchus, who's an academic who writes about Douglas Tilden statues. And she talks about how they can exist peaceably in San Francisco, even though they're super homoerotic, because same-sex sexuality is not even on the radar of people. So when people look at it, they're like, hmm, that statue makes me feel funny. But that they can't quite pinpoint what it is, and so then it's allowed to sort of remain. There's no specter of homosexuality quite yet, is what people argue around his statues, why they could, it, it exists so publicly, and then also signal male muscles in an erotic manner. Yes? You mentioned uh, several times uh, Stoddard's kids, the young men who he was with, um, in his home in D.C. and... Oh, kids, Oakland. yeah, yeah, his kids. Uh, did he have any biological children? No, he did not, he did not, yeah. Yeah. He had, he had a lot of kids, and they weren't all, um, you know, he, he had actually a number of, you know, I told you that Joaquin Miller collected Japanese boys, but, you know, Joaquin Miller also loved young Japanese men as well. 
and there's a number, you know, he talks about them. Um, but he does say that none are as handsome as Yona. Like, Yona is clearly his favorite, even as he kind of doesn't give him enough attention. <laughs> Thank you, thank you.